<laughs> I'm Suresh Vasudevan. Thank you all for joining me and uh, thanks for taking the time to spend time with us and listen to the session so far. So just feel free to take on any questions you might have. Um, you guys have gone through massive growth, obviously, in the last five years. Um, typically, you know, going up to a thousand now employees now, the culture must have changed significantly over time, or have you managed to maintain that? And if not, how, how, how has it changed? Yeah, so I think uh, my perspective, so let me basically start by saying how do we think about culture and the way we define culture, it's, it's almost sort of two attributes. Internally, we talk about one attribute as uh, in, we call it sort of the employee charter, which is a set of principles that we make promises to our employees around. Things like sort of career growth, things like you deserve to not work for a manager you don't like, things like good competitive compensation and a collaborative environment. The second aspect of it, if we are able to live up to what we describe as our employee charter really well, then we basically say you as employees should try and sort of live up to certain values that we espouse, right? And so uh, values around no jerks you've heard, you've, or at least we've touted that quite a bit. But there are a set of values we think about. So I'll start with that framework. With those as constants, I do expect that the company will keep changing as we grow. We are more process intensive than not two years ago. There's more cross-functional collaboration that requires a little bit more discipline than perhaps picking up the phone and calling each other. So I think the actual culture has to evolve for us to be successful as we go progress over time. What I hope has not changed is really what we think of as the employee charter and what we think of as the values. And if you ask me, I don't think I've seen too many things change on either of those dimensions. And honestly, the, the crux to making that happen is hire extremely well and then manage your talent retention extremely well. Right? That's probably the greatest control you can exercise once you have these firm principles around employee charter and values in place. Hiring and uh, retaining great people is, is really what we focus on. So I feel like so far we've done a good job. It's probably the thing that you have to concentrate most on as you grow over time. Cool. Better than it. I thought you were going to ask me about checksums and the size of a byte in a checksum or something. <laughs> now we got geeks for that. Yeah, that's what I figured. All the questions we really want to ask you, you can't answer. This is a public company. <laughs> uh, are there specific verticals that you guys have a lot of success in versus others? No, I think I would say there are certain verticals that are represented more than others. But first, I'll say it's a very broad horizontal platform. The workloads, if I think about the top few workloads, databases, so about 90% of our systems are deployed, are connected to virtualized environments. They may also connect to physical, but 90% have, so only 10% are solely physical. That's not saying a whole lot, because that's sort of true of most environments. Within that, databases are roughly 50%. And then there's an equal distribution across Exchange, SharePoint, file services as common application types. Then we have over 100 law firms doing e-discovery, lots of companies doing billing apps, lots of companies doing product development, so vertical applications, right? So that's the application so, mix. So in an e-discovery scenario, is that uh, a partner of yours surrounding your storage with, with uh, e-discovery software or something like that? Or? No, so we, we don't do anything explicit to, for example, integrate more deeply with autonomy or anything of that sort. It just happens to be a workload where you're both capacity intensive and performance intensive. Yeah. We do really well in those environments, and that drives um, our deployment. Often they are protected with disaster recovery. We do very well in that scenario. So that drives um, sort of a, a lot of deployments for us. Given those workloads, it's a very broad set of verticals. Financial services is probably our largest, uh, somewhere in the 18, 20%. We have among the top uh, few are technology, healthcare, manufacturing. SLED for us is unnaturally large. Between state, local, and education, we probably have 15 to 20 percent, if you will, given any any given quarter. Okay. I have um, to say, I've never been at a briefing from a startup where the NASCAR slide didn't in school include a school district. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so that's right. There are lots of them, and it. I guess at early stages for any company, it tends to be disproportionately large. They're more willing to take on. You, yeah, new there are so many of risk. them. You can always find some guy exactly. who's willing to exactly. dive in. Exactly. But as a percent of our business, it's still unnaturally large. It's almost 15 to 20 percent is uh, between state, local, and education. What about regional uh, areas of the, of the world that you do well in? Or Yeah, I think um, what we've talked about on earnings calls is about 21%, 20-21% of our business comes from markets outside North America, so outside the US and Canada. Um, 
within sort of international markets, it's Europe is roughly 13%, Asia is roughly 7%, uh, 13 to 14 and 7%. Some of our mature markets are, are sort of not unusual. So the UK is probably the most mature market in Europe for us, followed by a fairly good presence in Scandinavia, Germany, and Benelux. In Asia, it's uh, Australia, New Zealand is the most mature market for us, but followed by ASEAN and Japan. And then there's a whole host of places where we are taking on the entire country of China with a few teams and so on and so forth. Right? So it's very, very early and nascent. What, what do you think about uh, the Dell EMC deal and what kind of opportunity <laughs> do you, you know, see? I think the, the short-term implications of that deal are all of us in the industry are gloating, right? We can't, we can't find enough ways to describe how it's good for us because, fr <laughs> frankly, sort of most customers are either looking at Compellent or looking at VNX and saying we're not entirely sure what the future looks like. And, and also, even aside from product VNX lines... Wins. Yeah, most likely. But aside from product lines, there's also a larger question of who am I doing business with, my sales team. So very practical considerations that create opportunity for everybody else. That, I think, is the immediate implication. The larger question to me, if you go out beyond a year or so, is um, can the combined entity, how does it deal with the debt burden it has, and can it actually maintain ownership of VMware? and pay down the debt while maintaining ownership or something else happens. So it's a lot of unknowns that around VMware's fortunes more than in the storage business that have implications for the industry. So that to me is the second. To me, the other thing that it underscores is when someone like EMC who's dominated our industry for the last 20 years is basically saying it's time for us to get consolidated, it speaks to how much change that's take, it, uh, there is taking place in storage. Even someone as dominant as them are now being sort of hit by at least two if not three forces, right? The cloud being one force, the other way being shift in technology from disk-centric to flash-centric architectures and converged infrastructures as a third force, it's really hard for them to demonstrate growth with all of those three. And that's really sort of when someone as powerful as them feels the need to be consolidated, it speaks to how much change is taking place. You don't I think, think it's an investor driven move, I mean, to deal with the hedge funds, and stuff like that? It, it is, but I think I'm, I'm looking at why are the investors asking for where where is the value creation in this business? Had EMC grown, had our industry yeah, grown at seven eight percent as it did in the two thousands, yeah, yeah. they wouldn't be asking those questions, right? And so there's a and, there's a and fundamental. EMC can't maintain their margins. It's I mean look the, the the large vendors have all dropped their gross margins in product terms to the low fifties, right? And so it's it's really interesting. In one and a half years, more share points have changed hands than in the previous ten years. Market share points, gross margins have dropped by. 500, 600 basis points in a couple of quarters, and that's not happened in a prior 10-year time frame put together. It just tells you how much pressure there is on the product portfolio of most sort of mature storage companies. And you think that's being driven, I'm sorry, I think it's being driven mostly by the cloud, or is it by the startups like you guys, or? No, so I, um, my, my, if I step back and look at all the forces at work, I start by thinking that the cloud basically, um, so this public cloud, which essentially many of us are attempting to figure out how to coexist with the public cloud, but by and large it puts a dampener on how much growth and external storage is possible. Um, so we're from the years of seven, eight percent, we're probably looking at zero to two percent growth rate. That's sort of Amazon, Google, etc., who are mostly do-it-yourself kind of storage rather than buy from others. SaaS infrastructure as a service, companies like CenturyLink, etc., you could argue are not problematic for us in the industry because they displace who we sell to, but they don't displace the need for our product. But the public cloud, it's hard to argue that it's sort of not putting pressure on the growth in our industry, right? So that's <coughs> one. Now, that pressure hurts the larger companies more. It hurts people with content-centric storage businesses more, right? NAS is hurt more than block or transactional workloads uh, as thing object moves to, moves to the cloud. It's, um, and so EMC, NetApp that have larger businesses are impacted more, but it's gonna impact us all in the longer run. The advantage we have is we don't see the storage industry as a flat business. We see a flash optimized storage product line going from zero to 60, 70% of the market as the disk optimized storage technology portion of the market goes from 100% down to 30 or 40%, right? So we see a growing market 
within the overall context of cloud pressuring. Does that make sense? So that's how we think about sort of our opportunity. Very different for a large company that has to live with all of these forces at work. As you look at the, the kind of workloads that Nimble has run over the last five years, you have a pretty good insight into what's in the pressure environments. Do you see some of the SaaS offerings like Office 365 and Public Cloud, do you see a shift in workloads that are operating in Nimble and in people's private data centers? Are you seeing that in your data? Yeah, I think the one, uh, you know what, I don't know if I can tell you that we've seen it in our info side data because part of our challenge is when you're growing, what it masks is how many people are going somewhere else, right? Because share gain versus, over, if you were more mature, you would actually see the pattern shifting. Right. Um, but with that said, just in our sort of subjective conversations with a lot of customers, the place where you're starting to see that have an impact, on the one hand is Office 365-like environments, where many mid-sized customers are more willing to look at Office 365. At the same time, another, just I think a couple of quarters ago now at our earnings call, we talked about one of the largest deals that the company, uh, that Nimble has done, was a uh, outsourcing contract that one of our partners as a systems integration company won. This is with the UK's National Health Service for managing all of their Microsoft environments. It was over a $100 million contract. Um, just the exchange footprint was a single exchange uh, environment that had over a million mailboxes. That's a single exchange, not distributed exchange. And that was all hosted on Nimble, right? So it was one of the largest. So Office 365 is taking away from some that are essentially mid-sized that see that as an opportunity, yet we are seeing other opportunity with large hosted service providers that are saying we're competing for higher SLA deployments of managed exchange, where Nimble can be the infrastructure underneath it. And that same customer has over um, several million mailboxes under management and other Fortune 500 companies that are managing exchange through that service provider with us as an underlying uh, uh, storage provider for them. But that's probably the workload where I most definitively see that there's a sort of active investigation on the part of customers to go to the cloud, to SaaS. Five years you guys have grown from startup to essentially not biggest of but littlest of the big companies. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but all that on the back of one product, one line. Now NetApp was able to build one of the biggest of the companies on the back of one line. But I think it's possible to argue that that was really their problem too. Indeed. And one of the reasons that they've it faltered. It then became their problem. One of the reasons Indeed. that they faltered is because they were not able to, I mean, they grew that one fantastic product to just such a tremendous amount. I mean, it, it, they deserve a lot of credit for that, but they were never able to have another product. Right. Um, when does that happen to you, and what do you do? No, I think that's, first of all, I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, very few companies in our industry are single product companies with scale alone well, very few can have very large companies. Right, there indeed. Are, and I think guys. right, and I think it goes beyond storage. I think very few technology companies as single product companies get to be extremely large for very very long without facing challenge. Now, I think there was a actually the CEO of NetApp. I used to work at NetApp. Had a really good thumb rule. When you're at 10% of the market, you better be worried because most of your growth is going to come from share gains, and you have to expand the market at that point, or you run the risk of a dog fight uh, or a knife fight. However, you want to think about it. Right? And so, we are at this juncture, very, very early in what the opportunity looks like, given the size of the market we're competing in, uh, relative to sort of how much share we've gained. But I will say, at some point, scale is not as important as scope. Whether that scope is, uh, it, and it's, I don't want to go too far down the path of describing, but already we think of InfoSight as equally valuable in what our customers see and what we provide as storage itself is. InfoSight is a homogeneous monitoring environment or a monitoring plat uh, software for things connected to Nimble, but increasingly it's becoming aware of more than just the storage. It's aware of the network, it's becoming aware of the hypervisor, right? So infrastructure monitoring is one area where you're not just storage, you're something more than storage. Over time, I do think you have to expand scope. I don't think we have to face that problem for the next three to four years. I don't think it's a good idea to wait anywhere near as long as NetApp has done. I'm not sure I can give you more definitive answer than that, but certainly, um, Somewhere in the early 2000s is when 
NEDAP had they chosen a different path, and I was part of the people that made a mistake on that regard, uh, I think would have made much more sense than staying a single product company for that long. Yeah. Well, that's the, I guess the second part of the answer could be, um, there's basically two paths you can take to, to in increasing scope. You can have multiple storage product lines, a la EMC, or you can have other product lines. Yeah. And certainly you've got a converged infrastructure stack type thing that you guys are building. Um, you know, that's another direction you could head. Yeah, I, and I think we are speculating on what is the right thing to do three, four years from now. I'll give you a bias, which is if you are diversifying, then diversifying by adding storage product lines is not quite escaping the scale problem. Uh, it's not, you're st I mean, I think you're still bound by <coughs> the storage industry is only so big. And, and so, again, in the, in the context of looking out that far ahead, I would say it's not about more storage product lines as much as how do you think more broadly outside of storage. Um, I will say, for us, the most important thing is to stay focused on the prize for the next three years. Um, this is almost a corporate sort of strategy question that we need to visit every so often, but not do much about from an execution standpoint. Right now, it's all about acquire as many customers as rapidly as we can in the context of the market. But we very consciously are aware of the risks of becoming too large in storage without having built more scope, right? And I don't think that comes from more storage product lines. It needs to be more than more storage product lines when you really need scope.